This rolling green farmland of Oriol on the southeastern Russian steppe is only five hours' drive from Moscow. But in political distance, it's a world away, caught in an ideological time warp. It's not a part of this massive country the Moscow media frequent. They call it the Red Belt. It's the Russian equivalent of America's Deep South, defiantly conservative and passionately nationalistic. But the Russian rednecks of Oriol are not mindless right-wingers. They're die-hard disciples of old-style Stalinist communism, and they want it back. I bet you thought that all the old trappings of totalitarian communism, the hammers and sickles and the huge statues of Lenin like this one, were a thing of the past here in the brave new world of the democratic Russia. Well, not around here. In this rural heartland, you could say that communism is alive and well. So much so that in the parliamentary elections held last December, 80% of the locals around here voted communist. And throughout the entire country, the fact of the matter is that even now, after five years of so-called democratic reform, close to six out of ten Russians still vote communist. That's more than half the population. Anatoly Kolodkov is the local party apparatchik. For him, the popularity of the communists is common sense, not polemics. Put simply, people here were better off under the old system. Market economics may be the vogue ideology in Russian cities and towns, but in the Oriol region, it's still state-owned collectives, quotas and low expectations. The village of Memrino is a rural relic from the dark days of Russian communism, but lately it's gone from total obscurity to geopolitical prominence. This sleepy red belt backwater of 150 people is where communist leader and presidential aspirant Gennady Zhuganov was born and raised. The administrator of the local school, Valentina Ashtashkina, was a classmate of young Gennady's. She, like virtually everybody here, supports him. If it was left to the party faithful of Zhuganov's birthplace, like Galina Solodkina, who bought the Zhuganov family cottage, there would be no doubt whatsoever about the result of the June 16 ballot. Во-первых, у нас сейчас нет денег. Мы совершенно не получаем зарплаты. Мы совсем не покупаем, кроме хлеба в магазине, ничего. Мы не можем купить колбасы, мы не можем купить одежду, мы не можем купить обувь. Вот муж работает шофером, он стоит. Машина всю зиму не выезжалась и до сих пор стоит. Back in Moscow, with less than a week to go, the media and the polls have narrowed the presidential race down to a two-horse affair, with Yeltsin and Zaganov way out in front of the other nine candidates. <laughs> the other hopefuls have been written off including high flyers like the loony nationalist Zirinovsky, the politically defunct Mikhail Gorbachev, who probably precipitated all of this, 
And even the 44-year-old presidential pretender Grigory Yavlinsky. Whether or not the outsiders eventually throw their weight and their votes behind Yeltsin, Zaganov and the communists remain the sleeping giants of this election. But in the cities, support for the communists is nowhere near as solid as in the Red Belt. Here in Moscow, it ranges from dispossessed pensioners to these Western 60s look and sound alike radicals. Frankly, the party faithful are having their work cut out, getting their message across. When the communists lost their stranglehold on the mainstream Russian media, they also lost the battle to be heard. Not very far back, in 1993, these were the dramatic scenes when communists and conservatives opposed to reform tried to oust the Yeltsin government. Yeltsin called in the military, successfully retook the Russian White House and held the country's fledgling democracy together. But at one crucial point, anti-Yeltsin forces came dangerously close to taking the Moscow TV station. Well, that was only three years ago, and now at the height of the presidential election, journalists here at the television station and elsewhere can still remember that day vividly. So much so that they've determined that if the communists failed in 1993 to kill off democracy with the bullet, they're not going to succeed in 1996 via the ballot. The result is that the local media are up to their proverbial eyeballs in this campaign. They're not just reporting it, they're in it. They're not observers, they're players. Vremya is Russia's leading daily television news program. It goes to air on Channel One, the old state-controlled Moscow TV, these days half government-owned and half private. In the bad old days, journalists here were given no choice but to tote out the party line from the Kremlin. Now, at least for the period of this election campaign, they're toting out the government line willingly. But you can forget all those high-sounding media principles about objectivity and impartiality. Vremya's on- and off-camera staff are blatantly biased. They're unapologetically pro-Yeltsin and anti-Zhiganov. And the instructions are coming from the top. Ksenia Ponomaryova is the executive producer of Vremya. Uh, I'm still quite sure that communists are bad for media and for Russia. If all things were equal in the Russian media right now, the communists would be home and hosed. Apart from support from the older generation who've known nothing else, the red belt rural factor, crime, and the country's economic and industrial turmoil, there's even the unpopular 18-month conflict in Chechnya to bring the government down. But still, Yeltsin edges ahead with more than a little help from his latter-day friends in the media. Democrats who are using their position to give Zagan off an awful pasting. Uh, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing to do is to get a, a decent shot of uh, somebody. So Could be case, you or Zuganov, me. Yeah. This is Zuganov. Right. Journalist and computer graphics whiz we Nikita Golovanov normally works for the new and respected because Russian financial and business magazine Commerçant. Have a ride with the blind driver to communism, right. which will be your final stop. <laughs> Definitely, and very soon. But since the communists re-emerged 
as a threat to Yeltsin and reform, freethinker Golovanov and his market-oriented colleagues at the magazine have been putting out this outrageously biased publication. God forbid, the name of this propaganda sheet is short for God forbid that the communists should ever get back into power. The communists are not impressed. To say the least, they don't get the joke. Ну, я думаю, что это бред, это, это клиника, это надо лечить авторов, и вы, вы понимаете, не, не надо дискутировать с ними. Это вот чем, чем больше будет таких газет, тем больше будет голосовать за Геннадия Андреевича Зюганова. Party organizer and old-fashioned communist ideologue Grigory Rebrov is furious about not just God forbid's attacks, but also what the party regards, quite rightly, as highly unfair and unequal coverage of the communist campaign. No, никого судить не будем, никого наказывать не будем. У них есть возможность ещё у всех работающих журналистов проявить себя с лучшей стороны вот в самый критический период. Всё остальное простим. Petty hooliganism it may be, but Nikita and Ksenia, partners in politics and life, are not alone. A clutch of senior Moscow journalists have thrown political neutrality out the window. The new, that television now is not neutral. I don't think that they expect it to be neutral because it's unnatural for Russian men to expect media to be neutral. If Boris Yeltsin loses and the communists under Zaganov regain their old stranglehold on this country, Nikita and Ksenia face, to say the least, a dodgy future. Uh, I prefer not to think about it. Uh, I sometimes say that I'll leave the country, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, but I'm absolutely sure that we'll have some time to think about it. Either way, as this bold but possibly foolhardy Moscow couple could discover in a few weeks' time, even in the new Russia, democracy, a bit like life itself, was probably never meant to be easy.